celebrating 41 seasons on the air. Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, is, we visit the state's outstanding the, tree farmer of the year for 2017. Joe Huggins emphasizes wildlife habitat, recreation, and teaching other landowners what it means to be a good steward of the forest. In Southern Gardening, you'll find out what to do when your flowering annuals start to fade. Gary says let the big grasses shine in the fall season. And in the kitchen, Natasha will explain the difference between the many different types of rice available today. That's coming up on the Food Factor. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Amy Myers. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. So uh, during our program today, we're gonna travel to the largest home gardening show in the Southeast. It takes place in South Central Mississippi. But first, Amy, we're going to head to North Mississippi where one man is very much demonstrating every day what it means to be a good steward of the land. And his efforts are being noticed by many others. Tucked away just outside of Oxford, Mississippi, in the northern part of the state, is a beautiful tree farm. It is a showplace few people even realize is there. The owner, Joe Huggins, was just named the Outstanding Tree Farmer of the Year by the Mississippi Forestry Association. That took place on October 11th. As you might imagine, he is passionate about what he does and why it's so important. And his tree farm is evidence of his hard work and dedication. This is the old road that the farmer used to come in on uh, when he was when all this was in in farmland. It was row crop uh, back in the 80s. Joe Huggins bought this property and turned what was a cotton farm in Lafayette County into a tree farm. 1990 is is the year that that uh, GVR Goose Valley Ranch was born. So yeah, it it uh, all started back then. Goose Valley Ranch is a huge tree farm. It's basically 1,000 acres adjoining the city limits of Oxford, Mississippi. Our tour began here at the far western end of the property. You have a, a, a signature area around this, this part right here that I've tried to keep up. It's got the oaks and the pines and the dogwoods and a bunch of different species in, in this area. Really a nice place to come and, and spend some time to, uh, to ride to from the other side. Good access is important on a tree farm this large. Joe Huggins' first management work in the 1990s was upgrading the existing access roads to the property and establishing fire lanes throughout. And with the fire lanes and all the trails, probably over 20 miles of trails that we use for we, we bicycle or, or horse or four-wheeler or Jeep, it's really uh, turned out, it's bloomed into a, a, just a, a great, great place and, and just a, a blessing to have it and, and be able to raise a family out here. Recreation is one of the primary objectives of this tree farm. Timber is also at the top of the list. Moving east across the property, we see evidence of another objective. It's the first of several areas on the tree farm designed to attract wildlife. This spot right here is a, uh, a site prep we're doing for a, uh, a food plot, a green field, and, and, and we replanted those pines on the edge over there, and it's a nice transition. We got a lot of edge here with the hardwoods, and then we have the pine, and we've got uh, native quail here, uh, and that's one of my, my, my pride and joys is just seeing the coveys rise and hearing the Bob Whites singing and uh, it's, it's really make, it puts a smile on my face every time I see or hear that. Joe Huggins' passion for this North Mississippi tree farm and the outdoors has its roots in South Mississippi. His mother had some property in Simpson County near McGee where he spent a lot of time as a young boy. 
And uh, I remember going there as a child and, and, and always enjoyed playing on, on her farm down there and uh, just really was hooked and wanted some family land. And, uh, and, and when we purchased this in 1990, it really, uh, that's what it became. As a landowner, Joe immediately began to educate himself about forestry and natural resources. I went to uh, every class and, and everything I could learn about, about uh, the tree farming aspect of, of uh, being a property owner. And I wouldn't have been able to do it without uh, uh, Mississippi State University Extension. And I went to all the meetings and classes that I could in the beginning uh, and, and just learned as much as I could with, uh, with professional uh, consultants. As a result of this self-education, Joe had a written forest management plan for Goose Valley Ranch from the start. I bought me a tractor and a 10-foot woods cutter and, and began to work on the place and uh, just year after year just trying to do more with it and uh, really it was important to me to, to have something to leave for uh, generations to come and uh, enjoy it in the process. Joe's always open uh, to any recommendations, anything that can better uh, the property uh, for wildlife management or timber production. Garen Hicks is with the Forestry Commission. He has developed a close working relationship with Joe Huggins over the past decade. And the many things that, that Joe does on this property uh, from you know the, the wildlife management uh, to the uh, timber management and how he kind of uh, joins all that together uh, one big thing that, that, that I'm impressed with is how much of that Joe actually does himself. Uh, you know, to have, have a place like this, and I know all the work that goes into it that, that uh, Joe takes out upon himself to, to handle all of that. Joe definitely has the necessary equipment to do most any job associated with a tree farm. This includes a road grader, a front end loader, backhoe, a dozer, and even a dump truck. His forest management work over the last five years has involved the clear cutting of 32 acres, including this area where a road is coming through the tree farm. Joe has also thinned 150 acres across the property. In reforestation, 25 acres of containerized and bare root loblolly pine seedlings were planted, along with species of trees desirable for wildlife and aesthetics. Other management practices include QVM sprayings and a regular program of prescribed burning. We do the uh, burning of uh, roughly 200 acres each year in a three-year rotation. We burn about 600 acres total. So we start over after we finish the, the last 200 acres. And that's mainly for the, uh, the wildlife because the quail need the two-year native grasses to nest in and, uh, and it helps diversify the whole place. Okay. Our continuing tour from west to east across the property brings us to another signature spot, as Joe Huggins describes it, one that draws the attention of hunters and attracts a lot of wildlife. One section features what will be a winter food plot, while this past summer's food plot featuring sun hemp, sunflower, and soybeans is nearby. And then we have the transition, a lot of edge here with the the oaks and the pine trees. We actually have three, uh, three different groups of trees here with the oaks. And we have the older pines here. These are 30 year old pine trees. And then across the creek here, we have 25 year old pine trees. So it's, this is just really a unique area. He wants to, to use this place to show others, you know, some things they can do and learn to better their place. Uh, he's always been open if we, uh, want to uh, hold a, a CFA meeting out here with other tree farmers and other landowners, uh, do some workshops on you know, pine thinning, wildlife management, and get these other folks out here uh, to look out at the property and, and see some things that they can do and get some ideas and talk to Joe about you know, his experience in implementing those practices. On the east side of the tree farm is a landmark known as the Smokehouse. It was here when Joe Huggins bought the property and it's an important part of the story of Goose Valley Ranch. So we came in and uh, cleaned it all up and rebuilt it, and it became the focal point of the whole place. 
We've, we've had wedding parties over here, and this is where really we raised our family. Uh, I put an above ground swimming pool over here so the kids could swim, and uh, just had uh, a lot of good times here, a lot of good memories here. It's just it's a beautiful place, and I know I, you can tell Joe's love and passion for the place by just spending a day with him and coming out uh, and riding around on the place. You can tell it's uh, it's, his, it's his passion, uh, and you know it's it's something he likes to do with his family, and they they just love to enjoy the property. Been a lot of a lot of blood, sweat, and tears out here, but I think it's all worth it. And I couldn't have done it without my wife Linda and and the girls, my two girls that uh, really been supportive and really turned out, out to be a, a neat place. From Oxford, Mississippi, I'm Leighton Spann reporting. With about 5,000 visitors in attendance each year, the Fall Flowering Garden Fest in Crystal Springs is one of the largest home garden events in the southeast. In addition to countless plants and home items for sale, you'll find answers to just about any garden question imaginable. I was there the first day this year, October 13th. Whether you attend the Fall Flower and Garden Fest in search of plants, fresh fruits and vegetables, or educational materials, you won't leave empty-handed. A variety of seminars include topics like growing zinnias, butterfly gardening, insect management and control, managing wildlife in your backyard, and many others. Assistant Professor Kiki Fontenot addressed important reminders about fertilizing a container garden like a weed and feed for the lawn, that would definitely not be the thing to use in your containers for your vegetable or your flowers because it also contains a herbicide. A lot of differences between containers and in the ground containers, you're gonna be using soilless medias, so things made of peat moss and bark. Be very careful on manure use even um, in ground gardens or in containers, when the plant's actively growing and starting to bloom in some cases for some of our vegetables, it's too late at that point to use manures because you might accidentally be introducing E. coli or other bacteria that could cause humans illnesses. We have a lot of resource people here. Under the main tent, we have a plant doctor table. We have a soil testing table with extension specialists and other extension staff available to test your soil, answer your questions, identify your plants, identify your disease problems. We have a plant disease walking tour, an insect identification walking tour, a flower garden walking tour, an herb garden walking tour, and a vegetable garden walking tour. This is the place where plants get tried for this part of the country to see how they perform in Mississippi conditions. So there are a lot of new bedding plants that have not been seen by the public yet. The pond management tent is very popular. That generally attracts over 100 people to learn about how to manage your pond and your fish. For more information about the Fall Flower and Garden Fest, similar events, or resources related to all things gardening, visit extension.msstate.edu slash fallfest. I'm Amy Myers reporting. Quite the show it was this year, as always. Uh, just perfect weather for it, too, this year. Certainly was, and uh, we'll have more horticulture for you coming up in just a bit. Gary Bachman is going to reveal his love of big grass, so you don't want to miss that. Yes, quite a bit of that big grass on display in Crystal Springs as well. Well, what's happening in the markets, Layton? Well, Amy, in the markets this week, we found out that cattle on feed numbers are still running ahead of forecast. No changes for ethanol or other biofuel production levels, and the U.S. could be looking at its second largest corn crop on record. We begin, though, in the beef sector, where the government says the number of cattle and calves on feed for the slaughter market still running ahead of forecast. However, there still seems to be ample consumer demand. Trader Walt Hackney says one reason may be that packing the pounds on cattle has improved the taste of beef for consumers. They may have underestimated the acceptance of good quality luxury cut beef going into the domestic market as far as consumers go. And I think that the general idea of it, they got a taste of what this added finished condition of these big steers did to the quality of the beef. And they liked it. And briskets are tastier than maybe they were a year ago. Well, point being there, it was the marbling effect in the briskets of the bigger cattle caused a higher degree of taste in that product. The consumer loves that. That's what they're after. 
and that's what they expect us to provide. The Trump administration is withdrawing the so-called GYPSA rule. The National Pork Producers Council is applauding this withdrawal of the so-called fair practices rules. They say those rules would have been costly to the industry and ultimately put farmers out of business and raise prices at the grocery store. Well, we turn to trivia now on Farm Week. Our question this week, let's take a look at it. What Irish-born engineer is credited with helping develop the modern-day tractor back in the 1930s? Is the answer A, John Deere, B, John Brown, C, Harry Ferguson, or D, Alice Chalmers? We'll have that answer coming up. The EPA says it is backing off proposed changes to the renewable fuel standard, changes which could have impacted the volume of corn used for the production of ethanol. EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt says the agency will keep RFS volume mandates at levels equal to or greater than what was proposed back in July. Iowa U.S. Senator Charles Grassley called the news a great day for rural America. The October supply demand report continues to indicate it's going to be a very large U.S. corn crop this year once all the harvest is complete. Extension's Brian Williams updated me on the situation with corn and all the grains. What change was made to the corn numbers from the September report? Well, there are several uh, changes made to the production numbers on corn. Um, the big change was, and the surprising change, was an increase in uh, yields of about 1.9 bushels per acre, um, up to 171. Um, part of that increase was offset by a decrease in um, acreage planted, total acreage planted and harvested by about 400,000 acres, but that still left production up by 96 uh, million bushels. Will this be a record in any way? Um, not quite. Um, we're we're going to fall a little bit short of what last year was our record crop. Um, we're expecting about 14.3 uh, billion bushels this year. Last year we were just a, a shade over 15 billion bushels, um, but even, even despite that, it's still going to be a very large crop and probably will end up being the second largest crop on record. What's the market's reaction been to the change? Well, initially, the, the corn markets kind of tumbled a little bit, but it didn't take them long. The next day, they kind of bounced back. I think part of that was um, being supported by some of the weather news and a slow harvest across the corn belt, plus the soybeans kind of helped support corn a little bit as well. Moving to soybeans, what change was made or were there any as far as their uh, numbers from September? Well, again, uh, kind of similar story with soybeans. Um, both of the changes were made on the, the production side of things. Um, yields were bumped down uh, from 49.9 bushels per acre to 49.5 bushels per acre, but then acreage was increased by 800,000 acres. Now, I understand the trade wasn't really expecting any revision as far as soybeans, right? Not particularly. And on the production side of things, they, things kind of stayed the same. What really was the big surprise was the carryover um, from last year's crop. It was reduced by about 45 million bushels, and that kind of surprised a lot of people. And this gave the beans a little bit of a pop price-wise? It did. Um, I think they went up, they were up about 25 cents um, the day the report came out. It gave them a nice boost and they've kind of been staying steady since then. Back to the trivia quiz now to complete things in the markets this week. Today's question, we were asking about the development of the modern day tractor. And the answer is C, Harry Ferguson is the correct choice. We're going to pause for a short break, but don't go anywhere. Still ahead, big grass and lots of rice. Gary Bachman says big grass is perfect for the fall landscape. He shares his favorites on Southern Gardening. And Natasha Haynes explains the difference between the many varieties of rice now available at the grocery store. That's next on The Food Factor. Infinite Impact began with the goal of raising $600 million. And through your generous gifts, we surpassed that goal faster than anyone thought possible. But now, we have set our standards higher and spread our vision further. Infinite Impact offers infinite possibilities. And it all begins with a single step, a single accomplishment, a single victory, or even a single goal. One billion begins with one. 
Before we get back to the markets, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. Farmers and those interested in starting an ag-based food business are invited to an extension workshop on food as a business. It takes place on Friday, November 3rd at the Delta Research and Extension Center in Stoneville. The all-day workshop includes lunch for a registration fee of $15. The training will include sessions on food science, economics, and online marketing. And the final edition in the Food as a Business Workshop series comes up the following week in extreme North Mississippi. Again, it's designed for anyone interested in starting an ag-based food business. It takes place on Thursday, November 9th at the Hampton Inn in Hernando. This is an all-day workshop and includes lunch for a registration fee of $15. The training will include sessions on food science, economics, and online marketing. This will be your final chance to take this extension workshop this calendar year. Now, check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. If you ask a chef to give you some attributes for rice, they might use words like versatile, nourishing, and satisfying. Many people also forget there's more than just the standard white rice we usually see. In this week's segment of The Food Factor, we learn about the many other varieties that are out there. Rice is one of my favorite foods, but there are so many varieties out there. Today we're going to look at a few of the most popular types to cook with. People often wonder, is there really a difference between white and brown rice? And the answer is yes. Brown rice has its hull removed during processing, but retains its layers of bran and cereal germ. As a whole grain, this means brown rice is higher in fiber and chewier than white rice. It also tends to have a nuttier flavor. White rice starts off the same way as brown, but when it's processed, the hull, bran layer, and cereal germ are removed. This method makes it a little more starchy and sticky than brown rice. Basmati rice is grown in India and Pakistan. It's fluffy and cooks quickly, making it perfect for rice pilaf and curry dishes. Jasmine rice comes from Southeast Asia and has a delicate floral fragrance. It's sticky, but great for use in Thai cuisine. Just remember to rinse your rice before cooking to remove any extra starches generated in processing. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. For more recipes you can use with rice in your own kitchen, follow the Food Factor on Pinterest. Some gardeners are really attracted to big grass out in the landscape. Extension horticulturist Gary Bachman is not ashamed to admit he likes the look of big grass swaying in the wind. And this week on Southern Gardening, Gary tells us about some of his favorite big grass varieties. I like big grass and I cannot lie. Ornamental grasses are often unassuming in the landscape, waiting for their turn in the spotlight. Let's take a look at some of my fall favorites. One of my all-time favorites is pampas grass, though I may have a love-hate relationship with this perennial grass. I love the six to seven foot tall plants, and then the flower stalks shoot up and can be up to 10 feet tall. The flat grass blades have a rough surface, think sandpaper, and have very sharp edges. This is the hate part of the equation, especially when it comes to spring pruning. Another big grass for the landscape is Penicetum vertigo. The coarse wide leaves of this grass are dark purple black. Reaching four foot tall or more, the upright growth of this grass creates a landscape presence. Vertigo should be considered an annual, except on the coast where it may be perennial. While not officially a grass, the grass-like King Tut papyrus will easily grow to six foot tall 
and features triangular green stems. Each stem is topped with an umbilate inflorescence of a hundred thread-like rays. The flower clusters appear at the ends of the rays. King Tut isn't hardy below zone nine, but when grown as an annual, will reach impressive size. When the annual color is starting to fade, let the big grasses shine in the fall season. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. And Gary says there's a lot to like about big grass, and he very much suggests you take a long look at some this fall season. Well, that's going to do it for this week's show, but as always, you'll want to make sure that you tune in for next week's edition of Farm Week. We'll see why Rodney Johnson was named the Outstanding Logger of the Year in Mississippi. The veteran woodsman sets a good example for his employees. Johnson also emphasizes safety and the use of best management practices at all his job sites. And in a food factor next week here on Farm Week, the focus is on the trendy flavor of the season. Natasha Haynes shares her recipe for pumpkin pie spice. She says it's easy to make and if you do it yourself, you will save money this fall. Thank you so much for joining us this week. I'm Amy Myers. And I'm Leighton Spann. We'll see you next week. <music>